No, but seriously, everyone, oh, there we go. Thank you very much for deciding to take some time today um, to listen to a presentation that's a little bit out of the ordinary for a conference like uh, Amazon reInvent. And uh, my name is Ted Chamberlain. I'm a VP of cloud market development for a company called CoreSight. Uh, you know, this, the, the brief um, description of us we'll get into a little bit deeper. We are a, a carrier dense colocation uh, provider who is primarily, our footprint is in the United States. And uh, we also support exchanges, cloud enabled ethernet exchanges, as well as uh, internet and private IP exchanges. But, oh, don't worry, the sales stuff will come. We'll go deeper into that. So I have a, uh, I should probably come clean with something before we start. Um, this is my background. Um, how do I explain this, I guess? I should just be honest. Uh, I was at Gartner for 14 years. I was an analyst who covered the cloud data center carrier space. And uh, you guys probably all know Gartner. They drill things into your head. And the one thing that I really missed at Gartner is being out in, I guess you'd call it the real world. Analysts don't like hearing that. Uh, but I, just, I really missed being on the other side of the fence and seeing how things are implemented and how markets are, you know, how being in, live in a market. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the Gartner gene kicks in and I'm prone to outbursts, so I'm going to try to keep them uh, separate. And before, uh, after Gartner, I left, I had a brief sojourn at Citrix where I did product marketing uh, in the cloud market, in the uh, cloud networking space. So I've spent the last 15 years uh, not implementing and being knee deep like you guys, but hopefully giving you advice that didn't break your stuff. So if, you, if I did, you can come and hit me later after the presentation. So, wow, well, this thing scares me. I don't want to go buy it. Um, I have a pretty tough, uh, I'm in a tough position here today, um, right now. Not, well, number one, yes, I just had lunch. I understand that. But number two, you know, it's my job to convince all of you that, and again, if we take a look at all the uh, demographics Amazon provides us about you attendees, you know, your majority, uh, you know, all different size businesses all across the board. You're primarily in uh, architect, engineering, systems development, potential management role. And a lot of it's focused on the compute stack, not, not so much the network or the data center. So it's my job to mind, mind scramble you, to show you how in the movement to cloud, you really have to be as cognizant of how you build your data center capacity in your networks to support cloud workloads. You know? and, that's the one thing really we're going to, it's going to be my job to make sure that you walk out of here and go, well, I guess he wasn't totally wrong. So I came to be an analyst in, uh, this thing does scare me, uh, in the late uh, 90s. And I really came into the analyst role at an awesome time, you know, especially being a network analyst. Uh, enterprises in the early 90s were building these massive, you know, that time frame relay wide area networks to support computing in remote branches and remote offices, and mobility was really being driven into the, to the organization, so people were just dis dispersing all their compute uh, to all these different branches and locations, and then core computing was happening at a data center or a corporate branch, uh, or a uh, central branch. And then the mid-90s, the hypervisor was invented, and then what happened? Consolidation just completely was spurred on, you know, it was you know, definitely server consolidation, which led into data center consolidation, which led into a bit of desktop consolidation. And we saw a lot of workloads, uh, a lot of applications taken out of the branch, sort of consolidated um, into the data center. And it really, the network became, you can almost say less relevant, and the data center became sort of the sole focus. Uh, and then what had, and what's been happening now in the past two, two or three years, you know, as we've gone through probably a full cycle of maturity around infrastructure as a service, the network and the data center are taking more prominence together. You know, it's, we're seeing that interconnect, you know, pushing cloud applications not necessarily to the core, but to the edge to supplement some really, you know, core high growth IOPS computing is where, people, is where we're seeing a lot of our clients going. So it's sort of a nice blend now of the network being the computer I know people, systems guys hate hearing that, uh, hearing that phrase, but uh, we're seeing that the network is really starting to enable a different level of uh, compute processing in the cloud, and we're going to show you some evidence which we think uh, is really driving that trend. So what's, what, what's really, what's happening here? What's, what are we seeing in the market today? And we borrowed some information from some friends of ours 
at both Evercore Partners and Ovum and Cisco, and you know, and again, these should shock no one. Three times global IP traffic growth by 2018. Here, here's, here's the twist, just not internet. We're also seeing private growth, private MPLS, private IP growth, and happening within data centers is, uh, in the context of Direct Connect. So it's just not internet growth, it's, it's, public gro it's private IP growth as well. Uh, cloud growth, 12 times. Uh, what it is today by 2018, yep, that's no one should shake their head there, but what's interesting is a lot of that cloud traffic is being sort of generally shared by branches as well as you know, carrier neutral data centers like, like CoreSight. So we, you know, we are sitting right in the middle of this melee, so we're starting to see um, people looking at connectivity and interconnect that is you know, way beyond a gig or 10 gig and excuse me, moving towards 100 gigs, so we're seeing the direct benefit of that. Network, 19 billion network devices, scary. You know, that's, uh, especially if you put that in a mobile context, um, you know, things like um, SCADA units, you know, connected cars, uh, connected refrigerators, you know, blood pressure monitors that all have an IP address that, rep that re report metrics and, and live sort of in the, in the mobile device world. They all report back in to databases typically at large scale data centers. So that one to me really is, really is a frightening one. And then so we have this scale story, but the other half of the story is the shift in spending. And I'll tell you today, what we see is your enterprises are spending less money on your data centers today, and don't expect that spend to continue to have a rebound. That spend is gonna start to be pushed more and more away from a data center that you run, own, and build. It's gonna be pushed out into these as a service, managed services, or even outsourced markets. So you take this level of, uh, of detail in the network and it's, it's definitely the arrows pointing in one way and it's, it's, it's definitely a scary growth curve. And then you balance it with some workload data and this is a, a great report from our friends at RightScale uh, where they take a look at categorizing workloads and workload migration and this tells an interesting story too. Uh, you know, the story being as organizations become more comfortable with cloud models, cloud tools, you know, designing applications to be you know, net native on cloud platforms, they're moving more of those workloads to cloud environments and off-prem. And you know, we all talk about the low-hanging fruit going to the public cloud. Yeah, that's there, that's there for good. What we're, what we're seeing now in more mature organizations is you know, the next tier of applications. It's Office 365, it's the SharePoints of the world, it's, it's batch, it's a little bit of HPC where it makes sense. So we see you know, the real driver here that is uh, increasing the importance of both the network and the data center being where workloads are going. And then mobility, you know, I won't spend much time here, but to add, the, add to the tsunami of, uh, of data growth uh, in the world, you know, mobility, mobile data, mobile traffic, you know, it's terminating you know, not just on the mobile networks and down the fiber to the towers, but it's going right from the towers and the Ethernet infrastructure down to the data center, where it's, it's <coughs> being processed, rendered, hitting applications. So, you know, this mobile, this mobile uh, factor exponentially is going to put stress on networks as, they, as, mobile, uh, as fixed mobile converge a bit. You know, they won't converge completely, but it's another stressor, it's another importance that puts on the, the uh, enterprise class network. So what does this all, you know, how does this affect people when they go to jump into their next revision of cloud building? And, and this is definitely a core site view because we're really lucky where we sit. We sit, you know, at the crux of applications, infrastructure, systems, and data center and real estate. So we see a lot that's going on. And, you know, I think forever things have changed in the way that cloud services are being procured. Uh, you know, initially we saw cloud services, people coming in to a cloud for a single threaded application, tactical, very purposeful. You know, it's gonna be test environment, it's gonna be just Salesforce automation and nothing else, you know. So they looked for a provider who was a specialist at that one um, service, delivery, uh, service delivery model and did that, had the contract or signed up and said this is great. That level of sort of single procurement, single purchasing, single 
threaded cloud delivery model, we think is dead. You know, we think that the enterprises that we see, the service providers we see that go to leverage the cloud as an IT delivery model are gonna look for locations that are dense in ecosystems, dense in partners, so they can sort of the one-stop shop we think is gonna be much more compelling than going to the, the mom and pop specialist who does one thing and does it very well. And you know, again, we see this in our data centers daily. We see these holistic ecosystems just sprout up like mushrooms. It's amazing how in certain locations that we have, um, for example, Los Angeles, we've got two very large locations there, and naturally, our one Wilshire Boulevard is the most connected building in the, in the, in the West. And being the West and around LA, there's a lot of motion picture studios, there's a lot of uh, digital media. So naturally, they flock here, and what happens? Those people start meeting each other in the data center and start conducting business, and boom, ecosystem. You know? So we're seeing that really happen in a very natural, holistic way, and it just shows us that, okay, this shift in sourcing, this shift in moving your application to the cloud is, you know, it's, it's not a tactical knee-jerk to, oh, crud, we have to get something done, it's okay, what's our strategy? If we're going to invest time and money and shift responsibilities and shift budgets, let's make sure this will be a sticky proposition. So, you know, and there are some high-level points that our friends at the 451 group, I think, highlighted to support this, which we, we're seeing as well, is number one is hybridized IT environments are becoming the rule. They're not the rule today, they're becoming the rule. Uh, enterprises really are looking at how they can, can you know, kill multiple birds with one stone and just not a single um, method, so we talked about that. You know, we also see that you know, clouds that are islands are becoming a little bit tougher of a sell than clouds that are interconnected with enterprise network. So things like Direct Connect, what we do, uh, is much more compelling as enterprises really start to develop you know, their strategy to go from the core to the edge, to trading to, to partners, you know, they wanna make sure that their cloud is not an island. You know, we, we definitely see that as an enduring quality. And then, you know, we think our friends, the communication service providers who, some say, kind of get squeezed out of cloud because they focus only on, you know, lay, layer two, layer three networks, you know, there is a bigger opportunity for them to take a look at the cloud networking uh, connections and really make them optimize, you know, find a way how to build performance bridging across locations or clouds and really, put a, you know, think of a WAN optimization or an application delivery compression caching layer between cloud services and really help us chase away, you know, the, the, the big monster that is latency. So we do think communities and the way people are adopting cloud are forever changing uh, the way that business and really IT is being done and, and we live it every day and we're, we've had to, um, really make some changes, we've actually, we've embraced it, and we're really gonna try to be the lubricant to make communities work within data centers, our data centers. So at the end of the day, you know, it's interesting, you know, the Ethernet enabled data center, data centers like CoreSight and other carrier neutral network dense data centers become, you know, the services bus. They become the one central area where people are gonna plug in, <coughs> excuse me, plug in, deliver services, take services, you know, build on top of, you know, extensively uh, right on top of and build, and then, you know what, when the time is done or they have another method, boom, they're gonna start to look elsewhere. So, you know, we think that we're, you know, we might not be driving the bus, but we think we're sitting in the first couple rows here. We think us at CoreSight, you know, we sit in a very nice place to help recognize uh, the benefits of networks, uh, that cloud network, and again, partners uh, that are for us, driving into our networks and help things like interconnect and uh, direct connect really drive this cloud market to uh, the next uh, generation. Okay. So great, you're thinking, well, thanks, Ted. That was good. Checked my email, had fun. But what does this mean for CoreSight? Or really, what does it mean for other service providers like us that need to show you that we are, rel that we are relevant in the cloud ecosystem? We're just not passerbys or the, the dumb pipes or the or the, the, the aging data centers, you know, how do we prove to you that we are right in there driving what happens in the cloud ecosystem? Well, you know, we of course I believe it's through driving some core fundamental uh, 
elements or tenets of our business, you know, one being capacity. If you don't have enough capacity, either data center capacity, power, you are going to, at some point, really hinder your clients in their next growth mode. So we believe that when we build data centers, we build data center campuses. We don't take over an old bank vault building and try to shim a data center in it. We like to build it from scratch in campuses and connect our data centers with dark fiber in the ground. Connectivity, again, that's sort of the one that we think is cornerstone to our market. You know, we don't, we ourselves do not provide the capacity per se. You know, we enable the capacity in internet exchanges and our open cloud ethernet exchange. And we have partners that all come and terminate. So we believe you have to offer clients like yourself the choice to go with the carrier you love or hate today, or maybe the carrier who has you know, awesome performance on routes from New York across the, across the uh, Atlantic to Amsterdam. Or maybe it's the provider who has invested in a network as a service offering that'll let you, you know, uh, purchase bandwidth on a per minute or per second basis. So we think you need choice and we need to bring that. Then there's community. I think we, you know, we touched on that. You know, we believe our data centers need to be filled with like-minded enterprises, like-minded organizations. You know, we need to, you know, we don't need to go there and be the, the traffic cop on how communities happen. No, that's not, that's very self-serving and, and really will not help, you know, the market, you know, go where the market wants to go. But we want to be help, we want to be there to enable these communities with, you know, the exchange fabric to connect to each other. You know, maybe making sure that, you know, we, if we see uh, a dead spot in a community. So let's say, you know, community needs, you know, a compliance solution that, you know, we encourage partners to come in and help and plug in and deliver that. So we think that community is a big uh, component of what we do at CoreSight. Speaker. In the customer experience, that's the one, you know, it's interesting. In the cloud, customer experience and cloud services have not been synonymous. You know, they have actually been sort of the antithesis, uh, especially how cloud services generally are self-service driven. You know, you're not, you have not typically been engaged through a full sales cycle in, in a sales management and pre-sales and whatnot, but that's changing with a little bit more complexity. Uh, so we're seeing that investing in the customer experience is one thing that, you know, we will, we have done, we will continue to do, and we kind of hope the rest of the market kind of follows Pat because, you know, we want to be part of, we want to lead a good, very good community in customer support. We don't want to be the one decent guy or what I used to say, I don't, we don't want to be, we don't want to be the Westminster Kennel Club where we're the prettiest dog. You know, we want everyone else to be pretty dogs as well. So another of our core philosophies at CoreSight is the CoreSight mesh. So we, again, we have, we're in the middle of all this amazing capacity, clients, interconnection, applications, data center. And you know, we, we like to build this into sort of a cohesive go-to-market, a cohesive business, but also a cohesive strategy that helps people deliver on their, you know, their IT projects as well as cloud. So, you know, what we do is we have had pretty much from the day one, we've been a company that supports exchanges. So we have our internet peering exchanges. We have private network. So if uh, private network backbones by the carriers want to come in and terminate to get to applications or bring clients into other locations, we support that in a very robust manner, uh, both in North America, but we have international carriers as well because, you know, life does not happen in our North American bubble. Mobility is another area that we are starting to support interconnection, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as well. Uh, primarily by supporting the, the vendors who, the tower vendors, the fiber guys, you know, the level threes of the world, the people who deliver you know, the mobile traffic onto Ethernet. And the one that I know I'm personally most excited about and I spent a lot of time with is uh, our cloud exchange. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we think it's, the next iteration of how um, you all will start to procure cloud services, and we'll we'll, dip, we'll jump in that a little bit later. And again, the the mesh the mesh is great if it's got pieces, but if we don't promote promote diversity, best of breed solutions, 
and you know, giving, you know, creating competition, a competitive environment, so you all get the best value for your dollar, it's wasted. So that's our mantra there, is that the mesh really brings these, this strength into the community for cloud. So again, we have this mesh, we have these assets. You know, what, what we do at our data center, what we promote is this interconnection. You know, again, this is you know, probably a little bit more overkill than uh, we, we've talked about before, but you know, to be more you know, explicit, we have our public IP exchange. So you know, that's where it started, ISPs passing traffic to get out of the way of each other, right? So settlement-free peering, making sure there's no peering spots so people get de-peered, and a very safe place to do that. Uh, you know, dark fiber tethering is something we've started uh, to do, which has been incredibly uh, well received. So those locations you might have that are off the, the major network routes or fiber rings, you know, tethering you in with a dark fiber carrier to get to a location or data center. It's it, it really the people who uh, thought they were stuck with the MSO out in, out in the, the suburbs, whatnot. Now there is a solution to get to in a presence data center through dark fiber tethering. We have partners. Uh, that have very extensive lit building portfolios. Uh, probably the one that comes to my mind the most is Time Warner Telecom, who's a partner of ours who has a lit building portfolio in the tens to twenties to thirties to forties of thousands of buildings. It's probably much higher than that these days. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. But again, what we do is we provide the locations where all these networks, applications, uh, and infrastructure start to sort of come together in a logical fashion where you then can take a look and say, okay, my solution here, you know, I don't, I need it to be cloud-based. I'm not going care about bringing in AT&T or Verizon in a private fashion yet because I'm not there. You know, my, my workloads are very much public internet facing, you know. Maybe down the road, private IP is something I want to be involved in, but little, little, not today. Today's not going to be the day to do it. So, talked about our architecture, but we have a secret, we, I think we have a secret sauce. You know, I should think we have a secret sauce, right? I think uh, I'm pretty passionate about this, and the way our secret sauce comes about in conversations is really interesting. So on the, uh, the far left-hand side, you know, that's the typical, you know, the, the, the typical layout of of our networking, you know, you've got the server farm on one end, you've got the cloud services, and then you've got networks. And um, we've seen that a lot of hyperscale cloud companies, you know, are of one or two veins. One is our compute farm. We're going where the tax subsidies are great, the wind blows incredibly strong, and I can build until, you know, I can build till the sunset. So we, we definitely see them going into areas that are very rural. Uh, just so where they can build and scale and, and get tax subsidies. That's fine. Uh, the, the sort of the unintended consequence, a lot of them I don't think really have fully digested is that you know, in those places, there tend not to be a lot of network carriers. There tends to be not a lot of fiber. There tends to be not a lot of network infrastructure. So we see certain providers building islands of compute and they do it for very sound financial reasons. Uh, and you know, we think, hey, that's fine. You know, compute farms are really the bailiwick of providers who know how to build scale, know how to go into stacks and leverage open architecture, and and really build a compute farm that's going to be you know highly available and low cost. So th that's business, or that's an orientation we acknowledge. But at CoreSight, we kind of have a different thought here, and it's really evident in the way we've built our network. So our data centers are in the major network dense hubs in the US, and we'll show you in a minute, but they're in places where multiple, like tens, tens to hundreds of network backbones are peering. So we believe that that's the best place to put the compute, on top of the network, on top of the eyeballs, right where you can mitigate latency. So we have religious debates with the web scale guys, and you know, they kind of see our side, we kind of see their side, but where I think you know, there's been some common ground is we've seen a lot of these providers actually come in in our data centers, instead of putting a compute farm, they put network nodes, or they put aggregation nodes, so they can direct traffic into our dense network data centers, aggregate it, and hub it out to their, uh, to their compute farm. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And that, that's worked very well for us, and that's really the model that the majority of 
the large scale IAS providers live in, except one, Amazon. You know, Amazon is with CoreSight in five locations, and all those locations are smack dab in network dense locations. And you know, so I think you know we've we've thought alike with AWS for for a few years now, and um, it's interesting how we have conversations with the, with their competitors and. And, uh, and I think that realism of being closer to the eyeball networks and, you know, and, and really having a solid chance at mitigating latency is, is a strong way to go. So we were, I don't want to say the tide has turned. You're going to see a ton of building in Oregon and Washington State and, and those low in North Carolina. But you know, we've seen that there also will be, that will be pretty much balanced out with, a, uh, with builds that are focused in on uh, low latency environments as well. So probably the one, you know, the, the best use case we have, and it's the reason we're all here, and you know, we're just thrilled with it at CoreSight, is uh, we're one of a few providers who has a pretty impressive uh, AWS Direct Connect product and footprint. And, and basically, you know, it's, it's a solution where you know, enterprises, we all know Amazon doesn't like to let your networks squarely in to their DMZ and into their routers. So if you want to get you know, core, reliable, secure access into Amazon, you, you go into a place like CoreSight. And uh, we love the business. You know, we think it's, it's been a great partnership with Amazon. Uh, we think it really promotes a good ecosystem. You know, they're the masters of the ecosystem, you know, the APN network and their marketplace. They're willing to, to really you know, promote the benefits of uh, of, of partnership, and uh, and we and when we think that this will continue to grow, uh, we started at two markets with AWS, and I'll show you a map in a second. Now we're up to five uh, for the Direct Connect. You know, we also understand that you know that that's that's a that's a great core business for a lot of a lot of you out there today. But you know, we also believe that you know th th there's other ways to connect. There's other ways to do a, instead of a point to point or a direct connection there. there there must be a sort of point to multi-point way to get to other providers there in addition to Amazon. So what we have um, created is sort of our next generation of exchange fabric is what we call our, our open, uh, open cloud exchange. And this is about November, about 11, 11 and a half months old. And what we had done, it's, it's a layer two ethernet exchange, all built on brocade uh, MLX boxes. Uh, it's highly reliable, highly redundant. And what happens here is that you know, you as a, there's an A side, which is the, uh, the customer side, and called a Z side, which is the service provider side on the end. Really simple. Um, you basically, you uh, initiate a, a EVC on the A end, and then what it does is once you initiate it, you, you take a look at a directory of who, which providers are in which locations of core site. And then you find a provider you want to do business with, you know Netflix. You know, these are just re these aren't representative. These are companies you know, that could be on it. Uh, a, another carrier, Amazon, um, security provider, storage, and you, I like to say you friend them. You know you send a message, you know to, to set up a connection. They have the ability to yes open up the connection or block you if if they're really not, you know they're they're not in, in that space to do business. And boom, you actually have a on-demand, highly redundant network connection through a private solution, layer, uh, layer 2 Ethernet, between providers. And you can have as many EVCs across the connections as your connection will support. So it's sort of, a, we, we call it the digital mall. You know, you drive, to, you drive to the mall, you park, and you get to go to 10 stores, all in one location. So we think, you know, this is not, you know, I would love to tell you this is a incredibly unique novel solution no one else has, it's not. But we think that we're building it the right way. You know, we had a cornerstone, um, cornerstone company in Amazon to help, you know, help us initiate and establish it. And now we're looking to you know, spread it open a little bit to provide, to let in customer or cloud providers and customers across all verticals. You know, we believe this will be a good <coughs> excuse me, solution to add in some platform as a service providers, some SaaS providers, you know, uh, we're, we, we have a pretty strong vertical 
uh, off uh, vertical sales uh, team, so we could under we could see some you know, medical device manufacturers, some of their SaaS. We could see uh, financial services uh, being part of this consumer end, and and right now it's uh, you know again it's it's an on-demand connection. You know we have we're also understand that with cloud, I think you know the biggest bottleneck was the network, right? You can easily go out there, AWS, and, and light up many AMIs. Uh, but what happens, you know, what, what becomes a bottleneck sometimes is a network, right? So we, you can't get a network, you, couldn't, you can't get a network connection from AT&T or an ISP uh, and, and pay for it by the minute. But that's actually changing. The good news there is that the majority of carriers in the U.S. and really globally are starting to build network as a service offerings. And uh, we are going to promote best of breed. We have a few partners that uh, are pretty close to um, uh, delivering that functionality. And we think it marries incredibly well with things like infrastructure as a service, where you might only want to nail up an environment for three days, five days. And that network bill, it's not going to be $650. It's going to be $30 or whatever you know, the, uh, the, the pricing is going to be based upon utilization. So the Open Cloud Exchange, you know, we have it in, uh, we have it in uh, the majority of markets that CoreSight uh, plays in. And really, you know, just to be... To walk through here, you know, we, our core site data centers are in Chicago, our data center campus is Chicago, um, Denver, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, primarily in Santa Clara and um, San Jose. Uh, Los Angeles, we have a campus. We've got two very large buildings. Uh, Miami, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Reston, Virginia, uh, we've got two, uh, two campuses. We've got a campus with two buildings there. K Street in downtown DC, as well as a, you know, in New York City, we have the, the Isle of Manhattan covered with 32 A of A, and we are just about to commission a 280,000 square foot data center in Secaucus. So uh, right where the, many of the, uh, the cable landings are coming up in Secaucus, so we're pretty excited about that facility and really being an anchor in that heavily dense New York corridor Financial services, hedges, you know, a lot of the media companies, a lot of these guys, especially after 9-11, want to get out of Manhattan because it is so isolated. So we think that's going to be a fantastic ecosystem, as well as Boston. You know, Boston, we, um, we see that becoming our de facto strong enterprise hub and also SIs as well. So that's our locations for CoreSight. Amazon right now with Direct Connect is in five of those markets. You, as you can see, it's the Bay Area. Uh, as well as LA, Boston, New York, and Northern Virginia. So we're, uh, we, we're actively working with Amazon. We think we're a good partner. They, they tell us good things. And we hope to have that footprint uh, grow in the future. And really, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we know we're a co-location company. That's what we do best at CoreSight. You know, we're not going to go too far out of our skis. We're going to build fantastic, flexible, cost-effective, scalable data centers. We're going to fill them with networks that give you the choice, but we're never going to be a cloud provider. We're not going to, we're not going to spin up VMs. We're not going to buy hardware. We're not going to compete with a lot of our customers. That's what, you know, it's, it's ingrained. I guess never say never, but a lot of our philosophy here is we want to enable the true experts who deliver services like SIs, cloud providers, and SaaS providers. But we also think we, we, you know, we deserve a seat in the cloud uh, sort of platform, the cloud uh, footprint, or uh, as you can say here. So, you know, a lot of people take a look and say, "Colo, where do you fit?" Well, you know, we think we're uh, we we can be the cornerstone on the bottom layers of the cloud architecture, and you can kind of say we probably model this after the NIST, uh, you know, cloud uh, the the cloud model here. But you know, it's it's how we think we fit in. So, cloud enabled data centers being the absolute core of growth. Our exchanges, depending on what the connectivity needs are for your clouds, and then boom, you know, our partners build up the, you know, the, the private cloud and the public cloud functionality into orchestration, onto onboarding, uh, things like um, management systems. You know, we think that they're all, you know, they're all the necessary parts that we partner with. So we've got a, a pretty robust and growing ecosystem uh, that we are looking to help us build out our cloud reference architecture. And you know, if you if you think you're a fit with us, let's chat because you know we we uh, we really want to earnestly be a true enabler in this cloud space, and we know we're not going to do it alone. 
And uh, what I also want to talk about, sort of end the presentation on, is the fact that you know we are, you know, we are as we're as good as the as the service we deliver to our partners and clients. And I want to highlight two partners here that I think are pretty interesting plays and in how they work with CoreSight. Um, one is Adara Storage. You all might be familiar with them. They're a, um, I think technically they're out of startup mode, uh, but they're a pretty new cloud you know, enterprise cloud storage as a service provider based uh, in the LA area. Uh, what they do is they actually go after uh, enterprises who have tiered storage needs, which is just about everyone, and puts the highly critical latency sensitive parts of their storage in physical NAS and SANS in data centers like CoreSight and competitors and puts the, the tier three, you know, the cold stuff in archival in Amazon. So we think they've got a pretty interesting business model and the feedback from the market is that they're, uh, they're doing well. Um, so again, we talked about databases, low latency toleration, async replication. They're a storage company. You know, they do backup and recovery. That's their bread and butter. <coughs> you know, what happened with Zadar was interesting. Um, they are, uh, they're already embedded in a couple other providers. They heard of our reputation and our build outs and our density and they said, oh, okay, if we wanna you know, spread the redundancy for our services, let's talk, take a look at CoreSight and sort of similar to that happening, the whole Nirvonics, um, how do you call it, how do you say that politely? The, the Nirvonics situation where Nirvonics um, gave their customers 30 days to migrate their data uh, we actually had an opportunity to uh, help with help some of our customers who had exposure to Nirvonics migrate to Zadara. So we showed the storage company, you know, we could act quickly to migrate some clients to their storage platform, and boom, we had a test case that you know, you know, thank the Lord, happened pretty pretty smoothly. And uh, so that was one proof point. The other proof point was you know Zadara being headquartered. <coughs> You know, generally around the LA area, Los Angeles, their you know their target audience is digital media, this the the studios, uh, pre-production, digital encoding. So they think they can really play well there with their resilient infrastructure. And our data centers in 900 Alameda in LA and one Wilshire, just again, that's the community, that's our community for digital media, and. Um, they just, uh, you know, we, we introduced them to some people uh, in our data centers, boom, business was had, and we just had, we, we sort of let this natural partnership just happen. And that was enough for Zadar. They said, wow, you know, we're gonna sign, we think you guys, you know, give, give us a, enough push without being pushy, and uh, they've been, they're a brand new, but so far, uh, pretty strong partner. The other partner I wanna highlight is Exo Communications. So, if you guys are in the Mid-Atlantic and have uh, you know uh, Ethernet or MPLS? You know EXO. You know they're they're uh, probably top three or four carrier now. But after acquisitions, as far as size, uh, they are they also provide things like IP telephony, um, voice and data solutions. So they're basically you know a smaller version of an AT and T in the United States. And but they're very nimble, and customers actually like them. Uh, and what EXO was doing is EXO realized that they had to mature their offerings from traditional managed hosting and ISP-like services in the cloud, but they didn't really want to build a nationwide footprint of data centers. They said, eh, you know, we, we have enough uh, telco assets, we're going to have to find time to amortize, we're not going to add data center assets on top of those. So you know, they were looking for a neutral partner that they could deploy their cloud services on. And, uh, one was an enterprise cloud offering based on a VMware. One was a cloud vault, so storage offering. One was a cloud drive, um, similar to you know SkyDrive and all the other solutions in the market. But again, directed more towards a mid-size mid -size enterprise and liked our footprint. You know, we had known them. They terminate their networks and their data centers. Had a conversation uh, about you know our alignment. Talked to them about the open cloud exchange and how plugging into this exchange fabric could give them access to multiple. You know, to another uh, another addressable client base, you know, and boom, you know, that was enough for them to say, we think this is the right partner. So that was another great success story we've had, and we we've got plenty. I just kind of think these are the two that just show that you know the way you know CoreSight, you know, we're we're pretty earnest in the way we do business. You know, we're we're flexible, and you know, we just want to make customers happy. That's sort of our main goal here. So. 
again, thank you very much for your time. I know there's a billion sessions out there and probably snacks out there too, but really appreciate your time here. Um, and, you know, usually at, at a Gartner after presentation, we had like 10 recommendations for you. Do this, do that, go home, do this, blah. I'm going to give you one because I think you're all smart. You're all professionals. You probably have backgrounds that are better than mine. My one recommendation, don't build your network around your cloud. Build your cloud around your network. Think of how you're going to, where and when you're going to need your network interconnect and build from there. So with that, thank you very much. If you have any questions, we're all here in the front row. And again, thanks guys for your time. I appreciate it.